Hey everybody, Michael June here with Game Changers for Government Contractors. And I have a former guest, friend, coach on our team, you name it, John Barker here with me today. John, pleasure to be with you. Why don't you tell everybody, for those who don't know who you are, a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, happy to be on here with you today. I'm John Barker. I'm the founder of PTW Solutions. PTW Solutions help companies win government contracts at the federal level. We do that in a myriad of different ways from helping companies identify opportunities that make sense for their business, helping them properly position their company for success during the proposal phase. And when my clients win proposals, help them successfully execute and scale their businesses on the back end. I've been doing the government contracts for almost 23 years now and loving every minute of it. Not every minute, maybe, but love it. <laughs> Not Living every the dream. Living the dream. Not every minute of it, man. I remember there, when we first started doing government, I was like, we did it for a couple of years and I'm like, man, I need a break from this. It's just one of those things. We were talking right before we hit record here, just about all the things that we could talk about today. And you hit on a really important topic that I think is often frustrating for folks. We're going to be talking about focusing on winnable opportunities today. What I thought was interesting is you had told me that you had kind of looked back over the last year year plus since you'd started your business and was kind of looking at when clients engaged you and found that a lot of clients engaged you at the wrong time. It was past the cutoff. They should have made a bid, no bid decision and probably no bid, but they just blindly went in and had already made investments in time, energy, team, you name it, and then brought you in to do pricing. And you were like, uh, yeah, there's almost no chance you win this opportunity. So walk me through a little bit about how a company gets to that point. Let's start from there. How a company often gets to that point and then, and maybe we'll unpack some of the whys, and then we can go backwards and talk about following a process that will help somebody focus on winning opportunities instead of what they traditionally do today. Yeah, right on. I think first and foremost, pricing is an afterthought, right? I did a hot wash on some of my main clients my first year doing business. And when I studied kind of when I got engaged, it was a couple of weeks after the RFP was due. In some cases, the RFP was due that week. So there wasn't a lot mm. of time to put forward a thoughtful bid, at least from a pricing side. Technical solution was kind of already finalized. So there wasn't a lot of levers I could manipulate to control a price to win range. And many times when I put the numbers together, with my client's cost structure, they were prohibitively expensive. We talked earlier about wrap rates and simply the wrap rate is a difference between what I pay an employee versus what I charge a customer. And when you're dealing with Service Contract Act, SCA wages, those minimum labor rates are dictated by contract. Companies that are successful in that space have a sub one five wrap rate. Meaning if I pay $10 an hour to employ, I got to charge 15 and no more. One of my clients had something that was a lot, lot higher than that. And this solicitation had said that it was a lowest price technically acceptable. But they weren't going to even evaluate bids that were outside of the top five or the top 10 bidders. I can't remember the specifics, mm. but long and short of it is this client's bid wasn't even opened. They didn't even evaluate wow. the bid after I know they invested in a technical rider because I helped assist with that deal as well. After again, telling them many times, like, this is a bad deal for you, but you know, I did the best I could to educate them as to why that was. But we want to avoid those mistakes by really focusing on pricing at the bid, no bid decision, leveraging the historical data that's available to us in USA spending, SAM.gov, FPDS, and the like. Generally speaking, the government has an incumbent that they've already worked with and you would know the total price that was paid. And a lot mm. of times they publish, you know, what the budget is. There's also plenty of other things to study, but first and foremost, like don't leave pricing to the 11th hour because sometimes you might realize that client can't afford you or you're way too expensive for this client or you might win this contract and you won't make any profit, neither of which is a yeah. good deal. It's mm. not good at all. What I find is a lot of people are struggling to put opportunities in their pipeline because they are only focusing on what's in SAM.gov. They're not really building the relationships and those kind of things. So when you look at a pipeline, it's stuff that's popped on the radar in the last 30, 60, 90 days. That's the first time they've heard of it. One of the strategies we've been talking a lot about with our clients is building a long-term pipeline by looking at things that are recurring contracts, putting them on your radar, even if you lose them, 
so that you know about it and you're prepping for it, positioning for it, you know, six, eight, 12 months before it comes out. I think if we go back to the original point there of if you're only putting things in your pipeline that show up on Sam.gov, you don't have a big pipeline and you wind up chasing a lot of the stuff that's out there just because you're like, well, there's only three things in my pipeline. I have to chase this. There's nothing else for me to bid on or whatever. And if that's the strategy you're using, it's a failing strategy a lot of times because you don't know the client, you don't know anything about it. And then as you're saying there, when you're just saying, we've got to chase this because you know we need this work, you're not thinking about, can we be competitive? That's the thing to me that blows my mind is that question is never asked, can we be competitive with this? Not just, can we do the work? Because can we do the work is a yes, like 99.9% .9 of the time doesn't mean you should chase it. If you're struggling with your government contracting business, I want to encourage you today to go sign up for a free coaching session with me. You can go in the description of this podcast. There's a link to my calendar and you can go pick a time where we can sit down for 30 minutes, to talk about what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, what you should change. And then if coaching makes sense for you, I'll actually go over the options on how you can get started with coaching so we can take your business to the next level. Now let's get back into this episode. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. I like the word strategy and I hear a lot of people using the word strategy and they don't use it right. They mean tactic. A tactic is going right. after proposals. A strategy is setting yourself up for success by leveraging the RFIs, sources sought and pre-solicitations, but also studying your unique market, focusing on your specific strengths finding your ideal client profile and specifically the contracting office and the funding office that you want to target with your strategy, your marketing, how you want to leverage your marketing efforts and get in front of those unique folks by going to their industry pages, their forecasts, there's events. I mean, there's a myriad of different ways to do that. But again, focusing on the specific opportunities you can win long term, also by pounding the pavement, so to speak. And, you know, if you're a small business in particular, contact the large business primes. Say, hey, I noticed you won this contract with the VA. It's blah, blah, blah number. And, you know, we are just looking to maybe diversify your supply chain, network with the people that are running the job and get as much information as you can. Ask questions of people who are on site, figure out how to collect that intelligence. Again, once mm. you've honed in on where you want to focus your efforts on, because federal government's so big. Yeah. I mean, I think I was doing something the other day and there were like something 30,000 specific opportunities in SAMDACA. You can chase mm. everything all day long and just be busy as all get up, but you know, you're not going to get any success right. at all. And again, if you're just going SAM.gov and putting things in the RFP phase on your pipeline, you're not doing it right. You should have those things yeah. in your pipeline six months in advance. You mentioned something there that I think, I don't know if people keyed in on here about actually talking to people, talking to contracting officers, talking to the primes, talking to those people, having conversations with them. You know, what I see from a lot of folks is they will go have one conversation and say, well, that didn't work. It was one conversation. You may have to have 17 conversations with that prime before you actually get to do the work. The fact that you're actually talking to the prime is a win, but conversations over time are what typically lead to somebody saying, hey, well, John's not going away. So if John's not going away, which is what happens 90% of the time, they have a great meeting with a potential sub. They talk to them about doing some work and then they never hear from the sub again because the sub's like, well, I didn't get any work. <laughs> so I'm going to go to the next guy and they keep doing that. They've never heard from him again. And meanwhile, that prime has been contacted by 25 other subs in the next month. And so somebody else is on their radar and they wind up going with them. And you're like, why didn't you pick me? And you're like, because I didn't hear from you again. It's like one of those things where it's not just effort, because I think people think effort wins the race. And I'm like, it's time plus effort plus doing the right things. But the time component to me is the one in repetition that people tend to miss out on in all of this. When you're looking at a client, you use the S word there. So we'll, we'll go back to the S word strategy. When you're using the S word with a client and talking about strategy on helping them focus on these winnable opportunities, you mentioned several little things. If there were three things that were the most important piece for identifying, maybe that's the way to look at it, 
for identifying a winnable opportunity, what are those three or four things that make an opportunity winnable? You had a lot of great insights right there, Mike. First, I want to just comment that they say the biggest strength an entrepreneur needs to have is persistence. It's the ability to interpret no's as not yet. And I think there's studies out there that people need to have about six to seven different interactions with somebody before they make a buying decision. So you make one call, you don't get an answer. Are you even talking to the right person? Getting mm -hmm. back with the strategy, once you hone in on what you can win. And what I mean by that is what the founder has a resume that demonstrates what they've actually done, their corporate experience that they can illustrate in a future bid that they can do. Focus on what that is. Then once you have your core capabilities, and Josh has a great term for this, the value mapping. Map out what the value is of anything that you can leverage as demonstrable past performance. That's the key. Once you have mm. that, then you start your deep dives into the data. You leverage USA Spending, SAM.gov, Ad Hoc, FPDS, et cetera. And then you target probably three to five different customers. So once you've identified the pool, if you will, or where you want to start fishing, look at their contracts, study them, look at when they end, look at the big primes, do a search in LinkedIn on those big primes, look for people with a program manager, project manager, those are the folks who are currently doing the job and are likely on site. A lot of the bigger ones in particular will have a title of a person called a small business liaison, an S-blow. Mm. Uh, that person's job is to hunt for new small businesses, in particular ones with socioeconomic categories that are advantageous to that prompt. Many folks don't know that those large business primes are obligated via a subcontracting plan to outsource X percent to small businesses. That may be 30% to small businesses, 5% to women owned businesses and service disabled veteran owned business, 3% to hub zones and eight A's and the like. That's a strategy to get a subcontract with those large businesses. The other advantage to that is because you've studied that market, you know when those contracts end, you know who is buying that, who the procurement office should be. You go into SAM.gov, you set up your searches for that procurement office, and you start looking at sources sought. You start looking at pre-solicitation notices, and you put those on your pipeline. You put every single thing coming out of that office within a specific criteria that you set up. A lot of people use NACE, a lot of people use PSC, and all those are great. I use keyword search to come up with the top three to five NACE and PSC codes to kind of triangulate. Again, because you're looking at 30,000 opportunities a day, but obviously that's way too many. So you need to look at right. like a, a couple a week or whatever makes sense, whatever that volume is. But you know this because you have a, a focal point on specific agency customers, contracting offices and funding offices. Therein lies the checks and balances. And the value that I think I bring in my submitting thousands of proposals now as a contracts manager, I would assemble those bids and submit them to the contracting officials. The contracting officials, when they get these bids, they submit it to a source selection board who is made up of the, the people who define the requirements and they will rack and stack the bids on the technical basis and they will send it back to contracts who then looks at the price. And then they either award it to the lowest price technically acceptable or they can make a trade off with price. But I think my skill set has been I have interacted with so many contracting officials that I know how to put forth credible, defensible bids that win mm. based off of we are hunting in the right grounds for this particular client. We've done enough homework on the, the front end to identify winnable opportunities. So you have to understand, like a lot of these bids can cost you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. in investments to go after. So the bid, no bid decision shouldn't be taken lightly when it is. And when you're faced with making those types of investments, you want to win and you want to do everything you can to win. And again, there's a myriad of different tactics. I keep using that word, but again, there's no right way to do this. It is a yeah. process, whatever makes the most sense for you and your sales staff to collect that information relay it back to the people that need to know it 
As you're talking, a couple of things that come to mind. One is I just did a video and, and I did it for USA Spending. I don't know if you have seen this yet, but they are doing this big campaign to promote USA Spending. And so I'm one of the people that's going to be in that campaign for USA Spending. It's probably out by the time this podcast comes out. But one of the things they'd asked me about was doing some research on current contracts. And we are bombarded all the time with people who are solopreneurs trying to get in this business or brand new to government. And my thing to them is always, look, you want to be a sub. Initially out of the gate, you want to be a sub. It's a great way to get in this business. If I were in your shoes and I'm brand new or a solopreneur, I'd pull a report in USA Spending every single month that show either for NAICS code, PSC code, keyword, whatever it is, however you want to pull it. And I would look at who won contracts in your area with your agency in the last 30 days. I'd reach out to them. I congratulate them on the win and I try to see if there's a need for some subs on that because how many contracts out there are competed where people are like, look at all these resumes, look at all this stuff. And then they win it and they're like, man, we need to find people for, <laughs> for this stuff, right? So they're trying to find people to go on it. And you could be one of those people, especially if it's a larger prime, they're often looking for that. And, and like you said, to meet those small business goals. So it's such a viable, simple strategy and I can't tell you how many times over the years I have been asked, Mike, how do I find primes that have contracts? Well, I just told you. Go in USA <laughs> Spending, take literally five minutes. I think the whole video is under 10 minutes long where I not only show them how to set up the query, how to look at it, how to then go in and determine who to contact in the company and then reach out. And you just repeat that process. So you know, that's really simple to do. That video is on YouTube. That video is in federal access in the playbooks. It's called how to find primes for subcontracting work in USA spending. It couldn't be easier. That's my one little plug there for federal access today on that one. The other things that you were talking about that I think are so important is sitting back, looking at your strategy, figuring out the pools and stuff. And so I'm thinking about like the whole fishing analogy. I remember going fishing with my dad my dad was the guy that like, he didn't want to be in the house anyway. So he wanted to be outside doing stuff. And he was retired when I was little, he would go fishing for hours and he would come back with all these fish, but he had a system for how he did it. He would go to some of the same lakes he had been to before. He's like, well, I'm going to this lake or that lake. So he knew the lake, right? He knew his way around the lake. He had spent years investing times going to spots in the lake, trying different baits, trying different rod and reels, trying multiple rod and reels at a time, doing all of that kind of stuff, looking at the weather and all those things. And there were some days he'd come back with less, some days he'd come back with more. But I noticed when I was in the boat, you didn't pull a fish back every time you threw the line out and you didn't catch every fish that was on the line. Some got away right at the boat. It really is such a good analogy for government contracting because if you don't know your way around, you just kind of flounder around and never pick your spots and learn anything from them. And if you do learn your way around those agencies and you go back to them time and time again, you're not going to win every time. And you may get some that are really close that you lose, but you're going to start winning more and more because you know it. That just really stuck in my head, that picture of him going out fishing all the time and how it's so much like government contracting. Any final thoughts for folks as we kind of start to wind things down today? Other tips or techniques for focusing on winnable contracts? I love the fishing analogy too. And thanks for sharing that about you and your father. That's awesome. And it's amazing that you remember Which, that. It's such a beautiful analogy because of the locations. I totally agree with you. I think what is not well thought out is what state are you in? And what is the largest installation around you? A lot yeah. of people are like, hey, I just do this and I have to do stuff remotely or I have to you know, create an office here and there. Again, start small. Think big, but start small. Take the small actions today. Network your butt off constantly. You know, I have a couple themes in my LinkedIn, you know, one is always be learning and always be networking. And anytime I can do both yeah. at the same event, I Bonus. do what I can to get there, make an investment in doing that and stuff like that. Because you just never know which doors you need to knock on or which connections you need to make. That could be the connection that could make or break it. Hmm. One of the things that you said was really interesting too, is even when you land the fish, like I had the other day, my daughter, I thought I caught a pretty decent sized fish, right? I gave it to my daughter when it was kind of getting close to the boat and I was trying to grab a big net and my wife had the camera, she was taping it and it got out of the water on the videotape and it wriggled off. I was like, Arr! you know, and that's what happens. I mean, that's what should happen sometimes. 
But I, I like to play poker. I have played probably, gosh, a million hands maybe. But it's picking your spots. You have information that the industry knows, but you, what you don't know are what those competitors have. You don't know what cards they're holding. Mm. So you just have to assess the environment that you're in. Like when you're fishing, is it sunny? Is it partly cloudy? Is it raining? All of those little factors matter. That's context, right? I may want to, again, while I'm a bad fisherman, I went to go see a uh, Through the Boat Club, which we'll talk about later, but they do these wonderful things. They have expert fishermen come and train. Mm. That they're selling some stuff too, which is cool. Nice. And I go into those things and I come back going, gosh, I thought I knew a little bit about fishing, but it turns out I know nothing. These guys Nothing. hunt for specific fish with different rods and different gear and different line. I was like, I had no clue. I'm just trying to be versatile over here. And I have a swivel yeah. that I can pivot like a bait hook versus like a lure. And I think I'm hot stuff here. And that's why it's important to, again, surround yourself with a great team. Study the environment that you're going after. Do your homework. When the opportunities arise, does it make sense for you to continue going forward? And if it doesn't, just walk away. Because there's nothing worse than winning a contract that you can't execute or you can't execute and make money because that's a worse problem than losing a contract in my mind because it just derails oh, yeah. your future success and puts you off track. Yeah. And again, if you win a contract, get bad past performance, uh, it's going to be hard to dig out of that hole. I'll throw one of my sayings in there. It's not about how much you make. It's about how much you keep. And if you are focused on revenue instead of profit, you're focused on the wrong metric. You're focused on the wrong metric. You need to be focused on how much you keep. And I really like what you said. A couple of things. The first one, think big, act small. That's so important for a lot of people. And I think it really is important for them to think big, you know, have big dreams, have big goals, what you're trying to achieve, but you got to start small. You got to take baby steps. You're going to have to pass a million dollars in revenue before you pass a hundred million. Like you've got to hit that milestone, right? That needs to be one of your milestones on your way to your goal. And I don't think people do that a whole lot. And I love the poker analogy because the average person would sit there and look at that and go, well, I don't know what's in the other player's hands. So I'm just going to base my whole game, my whole strategy by based on what's in my hand. And if you do that, you're going to be a loser. You're going to lose because if you're playing people that even if you're playing them in, the, in today's the first time you've seen them, you can study their moves over the course of half an hour, an hour, even a handful of hands. You know, you can study them and you can use that information. In government, what's so awesome is most of that information is public. Now, you're not going to know the details behind the scenes, but you can see, hey, the contract went for this and they had X number of hours and it was bid at this rate. Like You can see some things that contribute. So like being able to look at that and factor that into your decision as you're looking at your hand is so important. And most people don't play the game that way. That's why they lose. They just base their decision based on, well, I've got a full house or I've got whatever, and I'm going to try to bluff my way through this. That's not how it works. You've got to use the information that's publicly available to decide even if you're going to move forward and how you're going to do it. I love all the analogies today. I could call this episode the analogy. <laughs> Out of everything we're talking about, I think it really does talk to the subject of focusing on winnable opportunities. That's where you want to spend your proposal time. Now, your business development time, your networking time, you're looking at a lot of stuff and you're trying to get it boiled down to just a select few that you're like, you know, there's an 80, 90% chance that we can win this. And then in certain cases going, I'll throw the poker analogy in, going, we're going all in. We're going all in because not only can we win this, we need to win it. It's important in our evolution as a company. So I, I love all that stuff. Thanks for coming on, talking with me today about this. I think the conversation went in some directions I didn't think it was going to go in, but they're all really good. For those that want to get in touch with John, his contact information will be on the website as always. John is a great resource that goes well beyond just the price to win side of things. If you're looking to scale your business, there's a lot of back office process system stuff that John's really, really good at. You can reach out to me, you can reach out to John, however, in order to get in touch with him. But thank you, John, for coming on, talking about all this stuff. I really, really appreciate and I value your opinion on all this stuff. 
I really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to the podcast and screenshot it and tag me on LinkedIn or whatever social media you use. So thank you again for joining us today and we'll see you next time.